Well, this might be an RTX 3060. 3060, geez, I can't speak. It's the morning, whatever, we're rolling with it. This might be an RTX 4060 or a 4060 Ti if you uh, listen to the person who posted it. This is coming from at Kitty Yuko, who was a hardware leaker over on Twitter. Now, what are we looking at here? Apparently shots of a Founders Edition style cooler for an RTX 4060 or, I mean, 4060 Ti, according to the Twitter post, although this very clearly just says 4060. So what's going on with this anyway? I mean, one thing this is interesting and it could be real. If it is real, this is most likely a um, you know, a, a, a Founders Edition design, a prototype, a model of some kind like that, um, and does not necessarily mean there will be a 4060 Founders Edition. Keep in mind, there was no 3060 Founders Edition. There was a 3060 Ti Founders Edition, though. I don't know if that has anything to do with the speculation on that. Now, from this same source, uh, actually right before the 4060 post, I just thought that was the more interesting of the two, um, there was also posted a 4070 Ti Founders Edition. Now that would be interesting because while we already have a 4070 Ti, we do not have a 4070 Ti Founders Edition. So in other words, th th that doesn't mean this isn't real. That means that this could be coming from a source that does have access to some actual NVIDIA boards of some kind, test boards, you know, they might have worked on a Founders Edition and decided not to launch one, maybe cut the board partners a bit of a break and uh, stop competing against them so aggressively. I don't know. Um, but these are definitely interesting posts. Now, this is a reasonable time to talk about, so what do we know about the RTX 4060? I mean, we're hearing rumors of the 4070 coming next month on April 13th, and that seems fairly solid at this point. There have been a lot of good leaks on that. Now we've also seen leaking that the pricing for the 4070 is going to be $750. I am hoping that that rumor ends up being untrue. Although with Nvidia's GPU pricing this generation, I'm not gonna be shocked if that is what we see. But what do we know about the 4060 and 4060 Ti? Cause again, this says 4060, but the post says maybe 4060 Ti. Anyway, um, <laughs> again, all we have so far are rumored specs. And so what we have right now is that the 4060 Ti is probably coming on AD106. And then the 4060 is probably coming on AD107. What does that mean? Um, well, these are the different actual GPU cores that can, you know, dies that, um, you know, it can be cut down. For example, the 4070 Ti is on 8104-400, giving us the full 8104 die, uh, whereas the 4070 is at least rumored to be uh, still on 8104, but then a cut down version of it with fewer CUDA cores enabled. The 4060 Ti would go down to 8106. Yes, as those numbers get bigger, it, it is the smaller and less powerful uh, GPU. And this would be the AD106-350. And then we see an AD107 rumored for the 4060. You can also see the CUDA core counts uh, coming down pretty considerably as well. Rumors also point to eight gigabytes of GDDR6, not 6X. And I think for a lot of people that is disappointing. Now, if you're on a certain memory bus, you can only fit certain configurations of memory, right? Each memory slot fits into a certain amount of, you know, uh, bits of your bus, which is why you will oftentimes get multiply multiples of like eight or 16, six or 12. In other words, you can't just throw 12 on one that has a bit bus that would support eight. It's eight could go to 16 or to four. You see what I mean? Anyway, um, so we are seeing rumors that both of these would be eight gigabytes on a 128-bit bus with only 288 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth and the power consumption targets there at 160 watts on the 4060 Ti and only 115 watts on the, uh, on the 4060. And it's also showing PCIe Gen 4 by eight on the power connectors there. Now, again, these are all rumored specs, so we shouldn't spend too long speculating on all of it. And again, this is a leaked picture that could be completely fake, but does seem to follow the general uh, NVIDIA Founders Edition design themes and all of that. So 
no reason to believe it couldn't be some kind of a prototype model uh, that's that's um, out there and people have a screenshot of. Interesting, I mean, seems to follow a lot of the normal design aesthetics, so uh, I don't think there's anything too crazy noteworthy there. But uh, how about this? Do you want to buy a 40 series GPU, but you don't like the prices? Well, if you were already going to buy Redfall, then this is at least somewhat good news because there's now NVIDIA announcing a Redfall Bite Back Edition bundle with their RTX 40 series GPUs. Now the 40 series GPUs listed are the 4090, 4080, and 4070 Ti at desktop, as well as an RTX 4090 or 4080 laptop GPU. To be clear, the laptop GPUs are only listing the 4090 and 4080, not any of the lower tier models. The desktop ones are listing all of the desktop models, although keep in mind there's no 4070 non-TI listed here. There is no official announcement of the 4070 non-TI. Um, and again, the rumor is that we will get the official announcement the day before launch um, <laughs> and reviews go out. Anyway, if you're looking for uh, game bundles, I'll just remind you that AMD is also running a game bundle right now. And at least to me, The Last of Us Part 1 sounds more interesting, but personal preference on games uh, could vary. So there is The Last of Us game bundle right now on AMD's 6000 series GPUs. Um, including, I just wanted to mention, I saw the 6750 XT drop to $379.99 on Newegg right now. I usually don't recommend the 50 class upgrade on the 6700 XT because it just gets you slightly faster memory, 5 to 8% performance improvement depending on whose benchmarks you look at. I don't have one myself to test out. Um, but usually it costs more than 5 to 8% more price than the base model 6700 XT. That's not currently the case, so currently this actually does offer better price to performance than the base model 6700 XT. And um, again, like that one would also come with the free game bundle. Now, speaking of discounts, uh, to celebrate its happy birthday, which it's not actually its exact one year birthday, but I think this is just to coincide with the Steam Spring Sale, um, Steam is having a the first sale on the Steam Deck. That's right, the Steam Deck is now 10% off. We've gone from you literally cannot, uh, <laughs> cannot get one, you have to wait months for them to ship or buy one scalped on eBay, to a while back, a couple months ago, you know, you could start actually ordering them and there's no massive wait list. And now we're actually getting a 10% discount. So that is awesome. Um, I absolutely love my Steam Deck. I do have the highest end one, um, uh, which is now discounted to $584 from $649, so pretty noticeable there. Uh, if, if you're out of the loop, all the basic specs are the same when it comes to overall performance. It's just a, it mainly a memory difference. So if you're going to be installing big games, you know, although you can, there are ways to swap out the SSD and you or use um, SD card storage, things like that. Um, you get a little uh, difference on the, on the screen here and all that. Also, along with this post, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, they posted the top 100 games played on Steam Deck. Now, there was there's a lot of ways you could you you could make this stat right. The top 100 games played on Steam Deck could be based on the amount of hours played, uh, things like that. But what they chose to do was use the um, peak player count. Now, I'm assuming, obviously, that they're able to support this as peak player count on Steam Deck rather than just on Steam, right? A Valve should have access to that data. Um, so it looks like Hogwarts Legacy is actually number one, uh, followed by Vampire Survivors at, at number two. Now, I've got to say that I did recently start playing Vampire Survivors on my Steam Deck and absolutely found it uh, incredibly addictive roguelike. Um, and my general opinion on the Steam Deck is that while it's really cool that it can support big AAA games like Hogwarts Legacy, you can find reasonable settings to play the game at 30 FPS. Um, I really think it's better suited to playing things like Vampire Survivors, which are you know titles that'll run uh, 60 FPS, lower quality graph, you know, you know, indie titles, that kind of thing. I don't know. 
Also, older games, it'll run at higher frame rates. Maybe it's just me and just not liking 30, 30 FPS, but it's very impressive, again, that games like Witcher 3, Elden Ring can run. Although, again, I tried Hades. I think Hades runs great at 60 FPS. That's my, uh, my other most played game on mine. I did also try Persona 5 Royal. So anyway, I think that th those types of games are really the way to go. Um, but it is cool that it can, st it can still play Cyberpunk, all of that. So, um, interesting. I've been, uh, uh, maybe I want to grab Brotato next myself. I think that might be it. That or Slay the Spire, which I think is on here too. Anyway, so this is the kinds of games that people have been playing on their Steam decks. Now, uh, also announced at uh, GDC is some new N news from NVIDIA, including a bunch more games coming with DLSS 3. Um, as well as new tools for adding DLSS 3 easily to games. So as far as new games coming with DLSS 3, we do see Diablo 4, although I looked at the system requirements chart and nothing about that game makes me feel like any 40 series GPU is really gonna be struggling enough to want to enable frame generation, but hey, it will be available. Um, and there's a DLSS frame generation um, streamline tool, I think is what they call it, uh, uh, being released to publishers as well as the Unreal Engine 5.2 plugin for DLSS 3 frame generation is uh, is coming here. Yeah, DLSS frame generation publicly available for developers at GDC, and this is through the uh, NVIDIA Streamline. And like I said, Unreal Engine 5.2 integration, which will make it very easy for any Unreal Engine 5.2 game to add DLSS 3. Some of the other games... Uh, that they mentioned uh, were Forza Horizon and Redfall getting frame frame generation. And also check this out. So Sackboy, which has a PC version, this didn't get as much fanfare or sales as uh, some of the other Sony ports. Um, but it, it, this came out with DLSS 2, but it also had a DLSS 3 added, but this is more interesting to me. It has SER, Shader Execution Reordering Support. Now, when NVIDIA's 40 series was announced, uh, DLSS 3 took a lot of the headlines, but they also announced improvements like shader execution reordering, which could offer some significant performance gains uh, when ray tracing. But it was few and far between, if any, games that actually supported it. Like, I can't actually think of a single game besides this one that's saying it's actually supported right now. There was a lot of talk about it in the Cyberpunk Ray Tracing Overdrive mode, but that's still not actually out for consumers yet. Uh, so Shader Execution Reordering um, is basically... Uh, I mean, this article summarizes it as a quick refresher. The shader execution reordering improves the efficiency of ray tracing operations by bundling them together. Uh, this can lead to important, uh, to important performance gains in ray tracing heavy games, such as Cyberpunk Overdrive mode, and that's one of the ones that NVIDIA talked about at launch, saying an, an up to 44% performance boost with SER. And again, I think it's the 40 series GPUs that take advantage of this. Now, Sackboy does have ray tracing. It has ray traced reflections, ray traced shadows, and ray traced ambient occlusion on PC. So anyway, I think it'll be interesting uh, to be seeing if shader execution reordering does start making its way into more titles now. Now, speaking of performance, when Windows 11 first came out, there was a lot of talk about VBS, virtualization-based security, having a big impact on frame rates. And Tom's Hardware has done a new follow-up article on this. Now, the way they phrased this is a little bit silly. I think it's just headlines these days have to grab your attention. So they say default Windows VBS setting slows games up to 10% even on RTX 4090. Now, what I'd like to be clear about here is that VBS is gonna have an impact on the CPU, not the GPU. So you're more likely to see its problems when you are CPU limited, which is more likely to happen on a fast GPU like the 4090, not less likely to happen even on a 4090. So the way that headline is phrased, I think is a little bit weird. Now, Tom's Hardware says that for their benchmarking, they usually have VBS disabled, and they link to an article on how to do this. All my sources will be in the description. But he said that when he was running his benchmarks for his uh, newest GPU hierarchy, uh, he, real, uh, with, he realized that some Windows update at some point 
uh, he doesn't know exactly when, seems to have turned VBS back on on his system. So it led him to, uh, I'm gonna shrink out of the way here. Uh, led him to retest things with the VBS results versus the non-VBS results, controlled for all the variables, same drivers, game versions, all of that. And here we've got some really interesting charts. So we have the average FPS uh, on the left here, and then we have the 1% lows in the, in the chart on the right here. Now, what are you seeing in this chart? Well, at the top, we have a 15-game geo mean at 1080p medium ultra, at 1440p ultra, and 4K ultra. And then you can see the VBS off ver versus VBS on results, and then the percent change difference that we see here. And again, we see the averages on the, over here and the 1% lows over here. Well, at 1080p medium, I know this is on an RTX 4090, so again, when you're most likely to be CPU limited, they were seeing a 5.3% improvement to average FPS by disabling VBS and a 6% increase to the 1% lows, although saw an even better increase at 1080p Ultra and 1440p Ultra with 8.1% and 8.7% improvement to the 1% lows. And I think that, especially when you're talking CPU limits, the 1% lows are more important for the smoothness of gameplay than the averages. Although the averages, again, seeing around a 5% boost there, a bit smaller at 4K Ultra on the, av on the averages, although even at 4K Ultra on the 1% lows, seeing a 4.9% uh, improvement. And check it out, in some games like Control, uh, with with uh, ray tracing enabled, 14.3% um, improvement to the 1% lows at 1080p, medi uh, 1080p medium. So that's pretty crazy. A few other standouts like Spider's um, Spider-Man Miles Morales at 13.6% improvement with max ray tracing enabled at very high settings, 1440p. Uh, some other games here again with over 15% improvements to their 1% lows by having that enabled. Now, other games not showing as big of, of a change. Now, some of the question then could be, so should you turn off VBS? And um, he speculates in the article, uh, and, and along with me, that, well, if Microsoft is enabling this by default, maybe there's, maybe there's some good security reasons to leave it on. Although, if you are just using your desktop PC for gaming, um, and you're really chasing the best results. You're the kind of person who overclocks, tweaks settings, uh, chases that faster RAM timings, all of that. Then why are you giving up, you know, so much uh, potential uh, performance here uh, for having VBS uh, turned on? Now, in my videos, I like to use kind of default out-of-the-box experience uh, settings on things because I think that lines up best to overall user experience. Um, but if you're chasing uh, any little improvements there, I think maybe take a look at VBS. Now, in other news, how about Intel? How about Intel Arc and Iris graphics update um, for some... Uh, Diablo 4 and Deceive Inc. support. However, this also comes with an interesting graph talking about Sons of the Forest, which is the incredibly popular survival game. And this at first makes it look, <laughs> uh, if you don't look too closely, like the uh, ARC A750 is outperforming the 3060 by 54% at 1080p and 14 and 78% at 1440p. However, that's not the case. This is a performance per dollar graph. So be careful how you read this. Although they do mention that this driver came with optimizations for Sons of the Forest. Um, it's not saying it's gonna beat A3060 by 54%. It's saying it's gonna uh, beat the price to performance of the 3060 by 54% at 1080p and 78% at 1440p high. Um, in other Intel news, there's some new information about Meteor Lake possibly being, which is a, a upcoming one that we had rumored, possibly being supplanted by Arrow Lake. Now, the original article here is in Chinese at benchlife.info. However, videocards.com has an article uh, about this with some translations and information, basically saying Intel's 2024 Arrow Lake-esque desktop CPUs uh, could feature up to 24 cores, support DDR5-6400 memory. And the translated quote is that... Um, we ha it had been rumored that Meteor Lake S would be launching in the first half of 2024, and but that could be renamed as Arrow Lake S and paired with the Intel 800 series chipset. 
Both Meteor Lake S and Arrow Lake S use the LGA 1851 socket, and according to the source, Arrow Lake S will maintain a maximum of 8 P cores and 16 E core configuration, and the rumored 6 P core, 16 E core configuration for Meteor Lake S will be canceled. Uh, there's some other info here if you want to dig in to the details, uh, kind of a su summary here on uh, some of the leaked specs for Meteor Lake and all of that. Um, anyway, I do want to move forward with a little bit of other CPU news uh, in something that's coming out actually soon on April 6th with the Ryzen 7 7800X3D. Now, this has an US MSRP of $449. However, uh, to my knowledge, there was no EU MSRP listed, so some people are going to be very interested to see what the CPU actually lists for in the EU. Well, we do have a listing here being reported by WCCF Tech, where they're seeing at computer base for 530 euros. Um, I think there are some other listings showing a higher price, but again, at this point in time, these could be placeholder pricing. This is just a notify me button, not uh, an actual purchase button and all of that. So I guess we may have to wait till April 6th, the launch date, to, to get uh, the, how much it will actually cost. Now, in other kind of uh, CPU-related news, but also motherboard news, really, MSI to phase out some Intel Z790 B760 motherboards with DDR4 memory. Remember that Intel's newest generation of CPUs, that well, the 12 series and the um, 13 series, could support both DDR4 and DDR5 memory, you had to buy the correct motherboard for the type of memory that you wanted to use in your build. At first, DDR4 memory could have made some sense when DDR5 pricing was extremely high, but DDR5 pricing has come down significantly, so it looks like MSI, uh, as reported by some Chinese sources close to the MSI manufacturing process, and then I'm finding here in the videocards.com article, um, is that the MSI will start phasing out some of their DDR4 motherboards, specifically the MP MPG Z790 Edge Wi-Fi, the Pro Z790 A Wi-Fi, the Pro Z790 P DDR4, and the Mag B760 Mortar DDR4. Now that's not their entire list of DDR4 boards, but it's certainly some of them. Uh, now how about this? These are fans. Yes, this is a GPU with five fans on the cooler. That's right, five. I have never seen a GPU with five fans before. I've seen three right here, like we're seeing here, but guys, if you are a mega gamer, you could get five fans on your GPU uh, by adding an extra little fan here and a little fan here. Alongside, you still get your RGB plate. So uh, no, no news on how long it'll take to run a whole row of fans right here on somebody's GPU model, <laughs> but five fans for the mega gamers out there. Now this model is the, uh, the Chinese Max Sun Mega Gamer GPU series. Now it's looking like the first one to feature this is the RTX 4070 Ti. And my thoughts on this is that, guys, the 4070 Ti doesn't draw that much power. Like, the 4070Ti coolers that are already out there keep it so cool, it's, it's actually overkill. And what I'd like to see is some models with cut down coolers that are significantly smaller to fit smaller form factor builds. Because honestly, I think, I think it seemed like Nvidia was originally targeting higher power consumption on their 4000 series, but then ended up being able to cut it back because the coolers, cooler designs for the 4090, 4080, and 4070 Ti all seem to be overkill for the 285 watt card that often operates below 285 watts. <laughs> anyway, um, but if you are a mega gamer, you can get some mega fan counts with five fans on your GPU. Now, um, in other 4070 Ti cooler news, Gigabyte is apparently refreshing its WinForce series with, with what looks to be a new WinForce design that we haven't seen before. And um, no word on the pricing on this one yet, although it does come with a slight factory overclock of 15 megahertz over the, um, uh, the reference spec on the boost clocks. But this does appear to be, um, you would expect this to be a lower end cooler model, possibly one of the cheapest um, cooler models out there, because uh, that's usually what we see from the Windforce designs. 
And I'll leave you guys with this. You know I love my OLED displays. Well, we're seeing another 240 Hertz, 1440p OLED display. This one coming from Asus ROG uh, with their Swift 27 inch 1440p. Uh, this says QHD, not QD OLED. So I was trying to scroll through here and see if there was any word of QD OLED here. And I do not see that. So as far as I can tell, this would more, more likely be a WOLED. <laughs> Um, from the LG panels rather than going with one of Samsung's uh, QD OLED designs, unless I missed it here. Um, this is, uh, I think, mentioning a USB 2.0 port, um, which, uh, sorry, H HDMI 2.0. I would rather see HDMI 2.1, but we do see the DS Display Point 1.4. Anyway, I hope all of you guys have an excellent day.